Hi all, this is Mr. Yeager for AP Physics 1. This is my last lecture on energy uh, for this particular, for the whole unit. Um, we have carried from looking at what is energy itself to what is work. And now the big thing here is we need to connect the two. We are creating what's called the work energy theorem now. That's what this lecture is particularly on. Um, we ended last lecture with a problem with somebody's pushing an object along a horizontal surface and we can find the work done on the object. The thing is, what does that translate to? What is that causing the object to do? And we can think about this and go, okay, if I start pushing this object, obviously I'm making it move faster and faster and faster. So what does that tell me about the energy of the object? I'm adding energy to the object, but what type? And in that particular question, it would be, I'm using work to cause or transfer kinetic energy to the object. And so the work energy theorem is a very broad topic. It can involve all types of energies, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at it by piece by piece, how we're going to add in kinetic energy and how we're going to eventually add in gravitational potential energy. So if we get going with it, we're going to first talk about the work, what we call work kinetic energy theorem, all right, which is a subset. It's a part of the work energy theorem. And so from that problem, we talked about how the net work done on the object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. All right? So we can, if we know how much work is done on the object, we know how much energy is put into the object. And we can figure out, is this kinetic energy, potential energy, thermal energy, any type of energy. But in this particular case, it's kinetic energy. And so I can set up a very simple equation where I can just say the net work done on the object the network, because again, we know all the for, you know, different forces can do different amounts of work on the object, but if I look at the net force and the network on the object, the network will equal the change in kinetic energy. And from there, I can then go back to motion and kinematics sum, because kinetic energy itself is equal to one half mass times velocity squared. All right, that goes back again to physical science, you probably learned that equation before. If you haven't, well, here it is for the first time. Ke equals one-half mv squared. So if I know the work done on the object, oops, went a little too far there. Let me go back. Okay. If I know the work done on the object, okay, I can eventually possibly figure out how fast that object will go after that work is applied. All right. So, if we go straight into a problem, if there is a one kilogram object that has 62.5 joules of work applied to it, okay, we can figure out maybe how fast it has gone if it starts at rest. All right? And so what you see here is basically what I've done is I know the amount of work. Okay? This is equal to the kinetic energy, the change in kinetic energy. Now, this problem is making a quick assumption. The object started at rest, okay? So it had no initial velocity, but now after I apply the amount of work here, I can figure out how much velocity is actually, how much I change the velocity of, of the object itself, okay? So if I finish up the problem here, okay, the answer would be 11.2 meters per second, all right? So if I apply 62.5 joules of work to a one kilogram object, the object, if it starts at rest, it'll be going 11.2 meters per second after this work is applied. So, again, the idea of kinetic energy, one more time to hammer it in. It is that energy of motion. You will, we will eventually get to two types. We have primarily only looked at one type, and that's what's called translational kinetic energy. All right? This is the energy where you're moving in a straight line. This is all we've pretty much been looking at so far this year. Or I'm assuming you've only looked at this type. You've, the other type of kinetic energy is rotational. The idea of it spinning, the energy caused by an object spinning in its place, okay, around a fixed point. The thing is, in this unit, we are really only going to be looking at the translational, and so therefore, the only formula we're interested in is this one right here. There is a different formula for rotational kinetic energy that will come up when you do rotation units. Okay? So, work can cause a change in kinetic energy. All right. So if we jump into another problem, how much net work 
is required to accelerate a 1,000 kilogram car from 20 meters per second to 30 meters per second. Okay? How much net work is required to accelerate a 1,000 kilogram car from 20 meters per second to 30 meters per second? All right. So what we're looking at here is the work kinetic energy theorem. Work equals the change in kinetic energy. And we always know change in anything is final minus initial. Okay? And so I can figure all these things out. I have, I have the mass right here, 1,000 kilograms. I have the initial velocity, 20 meters per second. I have the final velocity, 30 meters per second. All right? So I basically have all the information I need to solve this particular problem. So if I move forward, okay, you can obviously look at this and separate out the two parts. You can find the final kinetic energy, one half times 1,000 times 30 squared, minus the initial kinetic energy. Okay. Technically, you can pull the 1 half and 1,000 out. You can basically and just do 30 squared minus 20 squared in parentheses, but do what you need to do to get the problem right. There's no rule in saying you have to do it that way. Okay. But we can get a final answer of, okay, if I want to increase this object by 10 meters per second, okay, it turns out it requires... 2.5 times 10 to the fifth joules. A lot of energy. Be prepared for these questions that have a lot of uh, big numbers because we're doing squares and everything like that. All right. And so there we go. 2.5 times 10 to the fifth joules. That would be the work required to accelerate this object from 20 to 30 meters per second. Okay. And that acceleration doesn't have to be constant. Okay. That could be it. Could be one acceleration. It could be multiple accelerations during that time. That's the nice thing about energy. So, that's kinetic energy. Work can cause a change in kinetic energy. Okay? The thing is, work is a transfer of any type of energy, and so it could possibly cause a change in potential energy. So, one more time on potential energy. It is the stored energy in the system. It is internal to the system, which means you need to make sure you identify the two objects that are, that are working together to create this energy. All right? When we do gravitational potential energy, Gravitational potential energy, again, is always between the object and the Earth. Always, always, always. It might show up in this slide. But I just want to keep on hammering that in as much as possible. And so we already went through, there's many types of potential energy, gravitational and spring. All right. The thing is, when I teach this unit, I only focus on the gravitational. I come back later and do spring potential energy in a separate unit. Okay. But... If you do it right now, if your teacher requires you to do it right now, you can obviously throw it on in there. There's no problem. But you're going to see the problems that we go over. It's only going to be involving gravitational potential energy. And the formula for gravitational potential energy is mass, gravity, height. Mass, acceleration due to gravity, and the, the change in height. Obviously, on your formula sheet, your AP formula sheet, it's written as mg delta y. Same thing. Same thing, same thing. We're going to have to get used to any sort of notation out there, but that obviously solves or means the same thing. So, what we're getting into now is, is energy, quote unquote, conserved in the system, or will you change the energy of the system? Okay? And so, the thing is, this is complicated, trying to switch between these two ideas. There are what we're going to call conservative forces out there and non-conservative forces. And what the term basically is referring to is, will this force be a force that's acting within the system, and therefore energy will be conserved within the system? Or is this a what's called non-conservative force, where it's something outside the system acting on it? And that would change, quote unquote, change, change the energy of the system, make it non-conservative, so the energy is changing. Obviously, again, though, the energy must be coming from something else. It just might not be part of the system. So, conservative forces and potential energy go together. Okay, and we call conservative forces as path independent. All right. What we mean by that is, it doesn't matter how the object gets there. 
as long as we know what the starting point and the ending point is, the object, the, the, you know, the, the energy itself will be conserved. Sorry, I'm trying to struggle to say that a little bit. All right? It only depends on the starting and ending point. An object can fall from some particular height in the sky, swing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and eventually make it to the ground, or something can fall straight to the ground. They both will have actually the same change in potential energy. Okay? It goes back to the idea of the, two, the, your, the uh, hikers, one going up a long, flatter path and one going up a much steeper path. The change in potential energy for both of these is the same. They took different paths, but the change in potential energy is the same. Okay? And so what happens there is that's all within the system itself. We're not going to see any overall change in the energy itself. It must be coming from some other source. All right? So there you go. Look at that. Happens to be the exact sample I just drew up there. Hiker going up a hill, the change in potential energy will be the same. Okay? When we talk about springs later, as long as the spring is able to continue to oscillate freely and in the same manner, it will obviously continue to have the same amount of energy. Okay? It just might be converting. The overall energy of the system will be the same. Okay? So, all right. what a conservative force will do is a conservative force is a force that will change the potential energy to another form. All right? So what you're thinking about here is what is the force in the system that one is creating the potential energy and could then cause a change in the potential energy. Therefore, what can maybe the earth do to the object, it can, it can do work on it, it can pull it down, but that's just changing the potential energy of the system itself. Okay? It's going to change it to another form. In the most classic case, this is gravitational potential energy changing to kinetic energy. All right? If I have an object falling down, up here it has a gravitational potential energy. As long as we ignore air resistance and everything else, because air resistance will cause maybe the object to follow a crazy path. All, right? all I need to know is mg delta y up here. This potential energy should change into kinetic energy during that fall completely. The thing is, what force? What's the force bringing this down? Guess what? It's gravitational force. And that gravitational force is a force between the object and the Earth. Well, what's the gravitational potentially coming from? The object and the Earth. And so this is a force coming from within the system, and therefore, even though it might change what type of energy you have, it doesn't change the overall amount of energy you have. That's what we're looking at here. Conservative forces don't change the overall energy. It can change from one form to another, but the overall amount of energy remains the same. Okay? Again, spring potential energy being illustrated here as well. I'm going to move forward from that and not talk about that one so much. And so what we say is, I keep saying this overall energy, Conservative forces are not going to change what's called the mechanical energy of the system. The mechanical energy. And the mechanical energy is the overall energy in the system. This is the official formula. Okay? It is the overall energy in the system. If we want to write that down. And the overall energy in the system. Now the formula you can see, mechanical energy, let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to cross out these delta signs first. The basic definition we're going to use for most of AP physics is simply the mechanical energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy. Okay? You add them all up. Maybe the object only has kinetic energy. Well, that means the kinetic energy is the mechanical energy. Okay? If it's only potential energy, the potential energy is mechanical energy. But if there are both, we've got to add them together to get the total amount of energy involved. And so, when we do these conservative forces, we're usually looking at frictionless scenarios. All right? Friction is usually outside our system. We're going to usually not include the ground as part of the system. And so, 
as long as energy is conserved, we will not see any change in mechanical energy. We can change between the types that make up the mechanical energy, but we can't change the, you know, we can't add more kinetic energy there than what's potential energy. Okay? One must be, they, we must always add up to the same amount, basically, is what we're looking at. So when we do conservative forces, we don't change the mechanical energy, but we can change kinetic to potential. And so what we're basically saying is, okay, when you change the kinetic energy, there should be an equal change in the potential energy. Now notice this, there's a negative sign here. What we're saying is, as kinetic energy decreases, what should potential energy do? Increase. Or vice versa. If the potential energy decreases, I should see an increase in kinetic energy. As long as there's only conservative forces, and really the only conservative force out there, okay, the only conservative force that you really have to think about a lot, at least the way I do it in this unit, would just be gravitational force. If you're doing springs, well then spring force as well would be a conservative force. So those two would be your only two conservative forces really to worry about. Friction, applied force, normal force, all those we're not going to really look at in terms as conservative forces okay, being involved. They don't just don't they just don't come up very often. Okay? So we're changing the energy within the system, but the overall energy stays the same. And that's all that statement is basically saying. So what about non-conservative forces? Well, what's going to happen now? Well, if we did, if conservative forces don't change the mechanical energy, non-conservatives must. Okay? And so a non-conservative force will change the mechanical energy of the system. Something is working on the system. Something from the outside is coming in. It's either adding energy to it or taking energy from it. All right? And so this is often done by, by friction. You've got to assume what's friction always going to do. Friction is always going to apply a negative work, so it's going to take energy from the system. All right? Pushing or pulling, those are ways to probably do positive work. Try to increase the energy of the system. Okay? Increase the mechanical energy of the system. All right? So now... We do care about the path. All right. If you push a box across the floor from the front of the classroom to the back of the classroom, and you just go straight, and then you have somebody else curve back and forth, back and forth through the classroom. All right. I'll draw this out a little bit. So if I start from the front and go straight back, or what if I go like this? Wee 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 wee, going all around. Okay. Back and forth. The thing is, now we care about the path because. Will path A or path B run into more friction? Will more frictional force be applied? The answer is it's going to be B. B is going to be because it's a longer path. Frictional force is always going to be pointing in opposite direction to the way you are moving. It will always constantly be taking out lots and lots of energy versus path A where energy is being lost but maybe not as much. It's maybe not as difficult to do. All right? And so that does take us to like the hiking too. Somebody that does hike up switchbacks where they go up and back and forth and up to get up to the mountain, okay? They are going to do a lot more work. I mean, it's true. I mean, on their themselves and everything like that. Maybe not on the actual objects on them in the end, but they have to apply a bit more work because they're going to have to constantly overcome friction versus somebody that goes straight up, all right? might be have a little less work done. The thing is, we're not talking about here, how quickly are you applying that work? All right? Are you only applying a little work over a bit of time? Okay? Or are you applying a lot instantly and obviously that can be a little difficult. Okay? So, non-conservative forces, friction, pulling, pushing, applied forces are they do depend on the path itself. Okay? La -di -da, there's everything I just said. Okay. 
So finally, we get to the actual work energy theorem. Now I say actual, but technically we could keep on adding things to it. When we do rotation, we'll add more to it. But this is the main one we use for this particular unit. The net work acting on the object is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. All right. One that I sort of ignored that we can't, we have to make sure we understand. These are all the same formula. Work equals change in kinetic energy. Work equals change of potential energy. All three of these, one, two, three, they're all telling you the same formula. Two and three are part of one. Two is the same formula as one if the change of potential energy is zero. Three is the same as one if the change of kinetic energy is zero. Okay? It's all one formula, so usually we just write it out like the one I have underlined. Work equals change of potential plus change of kinetic. It doesn't mean, and we're going to see, and this is the nice part, it doesn't mean that we have to have numbers for everything. Zero, as I always say, is a very good number in physics other than on a grade. All right? So, we will be plugging in plenty of zeros and making this problem not as complicated as we might think it is. We just need to identify what energies are there initially and what energies are there at the end. All right? So this is the energy done on the whole system. Okay? This will affect mechanical energy. All right? So again, we can always set anything equal to zero. One thing I want to show you as well, and it might be on a future slide, but might as well show you. What did we say change in kinetic and potential energy are? That's the same thing as saying the net work on an object will equal the change in mechanical energy. Okay? The net work on an object will equal the change in mechanical energy. Okay? So let's look at an example. We love to do roller coaster problems because we get these are obviously roller coasters go down curves and up curve paths. It's not straight lines, it's not inclined planes. They're constantly changing angles. Okay? And the big thing there is anytime you change the angle of the inclined plane, I'll draw one out. Okay? On an inclined plane, there is only one acceleration. Okay, and that can be figured out. But on a curve like this, on a roller coaster, What's happening now is the slope is constantly changing, the incline is constantly changing, and so there's many different accelerations. There's an acceleration there, two, acceleration three, acceleration four. In kinematics, we would have to do a separate kinematic equation for every single point along this path until it goes flat, basically. So that's the frustrating part. Energy, guess what we only care about? Change in height all we really care about, all right? Because that will help us understand and go, hey, that will give us the change in potential energy and therefore possibly the change in kinetic energy involved, okay? So sorry, that was a quick aside. Coming back. So we have this roller coaster. The roller coaster is on a 40 meter, uh, it's up on a hill that's 40 meters high, and the roller coaster starts at rest. Ignore friction and negligible air resistance. So there's no friction on the roller coaster, that's a little scary, but we like to do these problems in physics. Again, all these theoretical issues. So we're going to calculate the speed of the roller coaster at the bottom of the hill. And then here's the second one. This is more of like, this is more AP level. What height will the car be at half speed? Okay. A lot of people will say, I want to be halfway down. Well, guess what? No. Okay. So we go through. Okay. You have your initial height, 40 meters. Final height, zero. Okay. Initial height, 40. Final height, zero. Okay. Your initial velocity is zero. We want to just write out everything we have. I like it. It's always, always good to get everything organized. There are no outside forces acting on the roller coaster. No air resistance, no friction. The only thing that's going to bring this roller coaster down is gravitational force. All right. And so since only gravitational force is acting on this, I'm going to say that again. Gravitational force is the only one acting on this roller coaster that's going to bring it down. Okay? It's going to speed it up down the incline. That was not, well, the track. Let's just say that. 
right? it's going to speed up going down the track. Well, gravitational force is a conservative force. Right? It's a force that occurs within a system. It occurs between the roller coaster and the Earth. You can't say the roller coaster has potential energy unless you look at it in terms of roller coaster and Earth. So that is our system. Roller coaster and Earth. Right? And so, that means the change in mechanical energy will be zero, which that means I can rearrange my formula to say the change in kinetic energy will equal the change in potential energy. All right? The thing is, I really don't like this negative sign, so there's actually a much better way to write this all out. All right? So we're going to kind of take it step by step, but you'll see in a moment what we're going to do. Okay? So if I rearrange this negative, sorry, if I rearrange this negative delta Ke, I can change it into delta Kef minus Kei, final minus initial. This will equal final Pe minus initial Pe. Okay? What I can do though is I can rearrange this, I can distribute this negative sign, add the negative KEF over to the other side, or add the opposite, it's negative over here, so plus to the other side, and add potential energy to this side. And what that leads me to is this great formula down at the bottom. This is going to be the key one. Okay, and I'll expand this just a little bit more to put work back into it. But the work energy theorem is basically stating the initial kinetic energy, sorry, the initial potential and kinetic energy must equal the final potential and kinetic energy. This is the same thing as saying initial mechanical energy must equal final mechanical energy. That's all we're playing with here. They must equal each other. And this is the easiest way to look because we can go through this and go, okay, well, KEI, the object's not moving initially. So is there any initial kinetic energy? No. The object ends on, quote unquote, the ground. The height is zero. So what's the final potential energy? Zero. So what's this basically telling me? Initial kinetic e uh, potential energy equals final kinetic energy. All right, and that's going to be the key. That's going to be the important part to really notice. So, so basically, you can see what I've said here. All right, everything I covered. So initial potential equals final kinetic. Let's plug in the formulas now. I have mgh equals one half mv squared. Sometimes we write this as mghi. And I use H. I tell my kids to use H. By all means, use YI, Y0, and YF. I, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So the initial height, and this is the final velocity. One thing to notice immediately, the masses will cancel out. So if I ask if this roller coaster was 2,000 kilograms, would that matter? Well, if the mass cancels out, it doesn't. Right. We're going to see mass cancels out in a lot of these problems. All right. Mass is going to be, once again, not that important. All right. And that's because gravity acts on all objects the same. It doesn't matter about the mass as long as we ignore the external forces. Okay. So we can rearrange and solve for V. Okay. V will equal the square root of 2GH. Okay plug that on in, so that's that's all underneath the square root symbol. Okay, thank you, PowerPoint, for only throwing that at the front. Okay. Square root of 2 times 10 times 40, that'll equal 28 meters per second. What is this? This is the final speed of the object at the bottom of the roller coaster, right? at the bottom of the track. Okay. That's what we're looking for. If he starts 40 meters high, they'll be going 28 meters per second. What if the object was larger? How fast would they be going? 28 meters per second. What if it was smaller? 28 meters per second. What if it was half size? 28 meters per second. Stop, right? Okay. If mass doesn't matter, it'll be the same as long as we can ignore friction. All right. Part B. Part B was asking, okay, where will you be at half velocity? And again, a lot of people think that, hey, if it reaches 28 meters per second at the bottom of the ramp, Shouldn't that be right in the middle, 14 meters per second? Okay, halfway down, right? No. Okay, that is not true. So, let's figure it out. I know that it'll have at, uh, if it's at 
half velocity, that's 14 meters per second. So now I'm looking at this a little bit differently. I'm not going all the way down the track. I only want to figure out the change in height to reach 14 meters per second. And so if I go back to my problem again, okay, get all this stuff out of the way. All right, I can look at MGHI. That's my initial potential energy. It's my initial potential energy here. Okay. This is going to be my final kinetic energy. And this is my final potential energy because this is not going to be zero anymore. I don't reach the bottom. So there is going to be some other height. And that's what I'm basically looking for. I'm looking for final height. How far down do I travel on this? All right. What I started with was this KEI plus PEI equals KEF plus PEF. Okay. In the prior problem, I could eliminate KEI and PEF. All right. This time, though, I can eliminate KEI because it still starts at rest. If it doesn't start at rest, bam, you have a KEI. Okay. But this one, we only started with potential energy, and at this point, we're going to have kinetic and potential energy at the end. That's the formula we're going to start with. This one is basically what you start with in any energy problem, this work energy theorem. Okay. And so now I can go ahead and start solving for it. What's going to happen to all the masses? It's going to cancel. It's on every single variable. So get rid of those, that dumb mass. Okay? Rearrange for HF. Okay? Basically, long story short, HF will equal the height minus V squared over 2G. Okay? Because basically I just divide G out of everything, and unfortunately G has to still stay in the, with the kinetic energy. And the answer is... The object will be at 30.2 meters above the ground. So what does that mean? The object started at 40. 40 is all the way up here, 40 meters. Where did he where where did the half velocity occur? And one way they like to ask this on an AP exam is they go, it'll reach half speed at the halfway point. Well, we already proved that wrong before the halfway point or after the halfway point. Or they'll say it's impossible to determine. It's not impossible to determine, obviously. Well, 30.2 meters is going to be right here. It's going to be before halfway. It actually doesn't even travel very far. Why does it occur so quickly? How does he reach half height or half speed so fast? Well, he has to because once he gets faster, guess what? He's going down this ramp a whole lot more quickly. All right, It's going to be less time for him to accelerate if he's already down most of the ramp. Okay? So therefore, that velocity, he reaches 14 meters per second pretty early on in the trip, almost basically uh, only a quarter way into the trip itself. Okay? It's basically what you can see there. All right? So, I'm going to take you back to one thing real quick. The last thing I want to basically say is this. Okay? The work energy theorem is extremely important. Again, it is the formula I generally go to for anything in motion. Anything in motion. Okay, uh, before I try to go down to kinematics or any other equation. And so what I look at is this. I go, I always go to this formula. Initial potential energy plus initial kinetic energy. All right, I'm going to add something there that we didn't go over just yet will equal final kinetic energy plus final potential energy. It doesn't matter how you order these things, the longs are on the side. What we're going to add in here is I'm going to add in what's called work external. Okay, I add in the idea of work external. All right. On your formula sheet, on your AP formula sheet, all you get is work is equal to the change in energy. That's what I'm doing here. Okay. Now, I put the work external on the initial side because what I'm thinking is I'm going the mechan initial mechanical energy plus any work being done on it will equal the final mechanical energy. All right. Well, what do I mean by work external? Work external would be F times D, or I'm going to write F D cosine theta. Okay with this F being force of friction, force applied, or any other force that's going to possibly be acting on your system. All right? I 
have it written as plus, but that's where you need to pay attention. Are you adding energy to the system? That would make it plus. That means you're doing positive work. Or are you taking energy from the system? Friction is always going to be negative. And so I would simply just change this from a positive sign, okay, a positive sign to a negative sign. Okay. If friction acts on it, that's going to pull energy out of the system. All right. Sometimes this is known as the thermal energy. Because if you do friction on it, frictional force will obviously create thermal energy. So sometimes they go, what's the thermal energy? What's the energy lost? Okay. That's usually due to friction, that's the heat. That would be your thermal energy, is the work external. Because that's what it's changing into. The energy that was in the system is now released in the form of heat due to friction. And so we can plug in problems that way. Uh, I'm going to try to do another couple videos where basically I try to show a couple problems so you can see how this actually does work. But that's about it for this one. So this formula right here is invaluable. Alright, so good luck. Thank you very much.